Most of us would think that nothing can come between a strong bond of a mother and her child because a mother is supposed to represent love, care, and nurture. And most people would think that nothing can come between that bond because it's so strong. But Kwame Wilson proved that bond could be broken by plotting the matricide of his own mother, Yolanda Holmes. Once again, welcome back to True Crime Tea Time. I'm your host, Lovely T. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button down below. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. If you want it, then come to me. Discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time. Stay dark history. Kwame Wilson was born in 1990 to his mother, Yolanda Holmes, and his father, Jeffrey Todd Wilson. Jeffrey Wilson was a member of the Gangsta Disciples Street Gang. He was a well-known drug dealer in the area, and he ran a few dope spots in the projects. One day, somebody owed him money, and they had refused to pay up. So Jeffrey decided to take matters into his own home by setting an entire apartment complex on fire. This resulted in the death of two men, Floyd Spencer and Lee Burnett, both of whom owed him a drug debt. He was spotted running from the scene and later faced trial where he was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Now, a lot of the old folks say that sometimes certain people should not have children, should not mix their DNA. But unfortunately for Yolanda, it was too late because she found herself pregnant by Jeff Wilson. So while Jeff was on trial fighting for his life, Yolanda ended up giving birth to their son, Kwame Wilson. Kwame was born shortly after his father's arrest and trial for murder. Yolanda did not want her only son to fall victim to the streets like his father did. So Yolanda made sure to look out for Kwame in any way possible. She kept Kwame with her. A lot of Yolanda's co-workers called Kwame the shop baby because Kwame was always at her hair salon every day after school and on weekends. She kept Kwame on her hip. Yolanda kept his hair done. He got fresh fades. And when he decided that he wanted dreadlocks, Yolanda was the one who started his locks for him and maintained them as well. She was always spoiling Kwame. She gave him whatever he wanted. For his 16th birthday, she got him a brand new Mustang. She covered all his prom expenses. She got him and his girlfriend's custom outfits. Yolanda really looked out for her son because she wanted the best for him and she never wanted her son to rely on the streets to make his money. On top of giving Kwame money and jewelry and shoes and things to make him happy, Yolanda also talked to him about getting a job and the importance of work. He did not want to work in her shop, so she helped him get another job outside of the shop. Now on top of Kwame working a regular nine to five job, he was also an aspiring actor and rapper. And he became really popular on YouTube in the early 2010s with this web series that he created himself called Nick Stories. And a lot of people in the Midwest, including Chicago, tuned in you know, every few weeks to watch the new episodes of Nick Stories. Now you so damn disrespectful. I build stuff in these streets. People rely on me. They rely on me. You thought I, you, you, you thought I knew or planned that I was gonna be taking care of my brothers and sisters? Well, Yolanda was a caring 45 year old businesswoman and mother. She had worked hard her entire life and even opened up her own hair shop called Nappy Heads. She ran that hair shop for over 16 years in Uptown Chicago. It was a very upscale shop and a lot of people love Yolanda in the neighborhood. She took care of everybody's hair, no matter the texture, no matter if you had perm, if you were natural. She looked out for everyone as best as she could. She also did a lot of back to school drives where she would help children whose parents couldn't afford to get their hair done. She would gift them with hair services for back to school. She was very involved in her community and a lot of her friends called her giant. Even though Yolanda Holmes was itty bitty, super short, the thing that was giant about Yolanda was her big heart and how she gave back to people and she looked out for so many people selflessly. Unfortunately, Kwame didn't get this trait. 
Yolanda was also described as a health nut by many of her friends. She loved to eat healthy and she also loved to travel. She filled her passport not once, but twice. She went to so many different countries around the world. She ate good food. She really lived the life that she had wanted to after working so hard for 16 years to maintain her shop. And so many people were proud of her. She posted a lot of her vacation pictures. She went on vacation with a lot of her friends and even paid for a lot of them to go on vacations with her, some of the ones who couldn't afford it. So Yolanda definitely looked out for everyone around her, not just her son, Kwame. In the early hours of September 2nd, 2012, Yolanda was sleeping peacefully next to her boyfriend, Curtis Wyatt. When an unknown man walked into her building, he walked up to a sleeping Yolanda and her boyfriend and basically pointed the gun to her temple and pulled the trigger. Him pulling that trigger is what woke up Curtis. And at that point, when Curtis saw what was going on, he got up to fight the assailant and the assailant ended up stabbing Curtis. But fortunately for Curtis, he didn't die. He didn't die, but he was knocked unconscious. So while he was laying on the ground unconscious, the perpetrator then proceeded to stab Yolanda over and over and over again. It was so much overkill that there was blood on the ceilings, there was blood all over the walls. It did not make any sense why this person was so angry at Yolanda. Curtis had been knocked unconscious so hard with the butt of the gun that the bottom part of the gun ended up falling off and being left in the apartment. Once Curtis came to, he woke up and he just saw a scene of horror. There was blood everywhere. Yolanda was laying there in the bed dead with a gunshot wound to the head and multiple stab wounds. At that point, Curtis called 911 and the police ended up coming to the apartment as soon as possible. When detectives John Corrales and Sergeant Michelle Woods arrived, they were shocked. This was not the south side of Chicago. This was a high rise apartment in downtown Chicago near the Miracle Mile where, you know, murders and stuff like this were not that common in this part of Chicago, especially something so violent. You might see this on the south side, even the west side, but not in this particular building that Yolanda lived in. The uptown building which Yolanda lived in was considered a safe haven. And Detective Carolla said he was so shocked when he walked in. He said that literally the walls looked like they were painted in blood. That is how much blood splatter was all over this apartment. They also noticed that there were strands of hair stuck to the wall as if somebody had grabbed Yolanda's head and just started bashing it over and over again onto the wall. Detectives concluded that Yolanda was definitely killed in her sleep at close point range, but then they later on found a paring knife and that paring knife was what was used to stab her over and over again. And it was also what was used to stab her boyfriend, Curtis, as well. Curtis survived the attack with just a bunch of gashes on his hands and some gashes on his forearms, but for the most part, he was going to live. When detectives were in the hallway looking around, they found money everywhere. So they had automatically assumed that it was a robbery gone wrong because a lot of people knew that Yolanda kept money on her and you know she was a pretty wealthy woman. So they had assumed it was just a random robbery gone terribly wrong. Another thing that they found on the scene was a white earbud from a phone. So they found that and they put that into evidence. They also found the butt of the gun that was used to knock Curtis unconscious. When they ran fingerprints on the gun, they were not able to find anything because the gun was so bloody that they were unable to lift any fingerprints off of the gun. So everybody was so confused by this murder because Yolanda was well loved and people just did not understand why she would die such a violent death. So of course, the first person that they suspected was Curtis, because after all, he was her living boyfriend. And you know, they always suspect the spouse of the boyfriend first. He was also the only person there, and he also conveniently survived the attack as well. Detectives initially thought that Curtis had made up the entire story about the unknown assailant, just to create a ruse and throw them off. But the more they dug into it, they realized he wasn't lying. They weren't really inclined to believe Curtis, because of the way his attitude was when they were questioning him. When they asked him, who do you think could have did this to Yolanda? Who could have killed your girlfriend like that? He basically told them in his Suge Knight voice, he don't get paid to solve homicides, that that is the Chicago PD's job to figure out who killed Yolanda. Now, that's not really anything they were expecting a boyfriend to say. You would think he'd be a little bit more concerned. You'd think he'd be a little bit more upset or trying to, you know, at least give them some type of information. 
but he was very standoffish with the police and the police were not really feeling his vibe. So they kind of kept him on the suspect list while looking into other people. Now, on top of that, Yolanda's friend, Eric Pierre, also told several people that he felt like maybe Curtis could have been behind it because their relationship at certain points were very volatile. Um, there were some domestic abuse claims levied by Yolanda against him at one point to all of her friends. So even the friends were also giving Curtis the side eye because again, he was there with her and he survived. Now, one thing about these particular apartment buildings is that they are surrounded by cameras. So obviously, if Yolanda's in her building and it's a random person ringing her doorbell, she would see them on camera and you know not let them in. So they felt like this person had to know Yolanda or Yolanda had to have let them in for them to be able to get access one into the building, let alone into her apartment. So they felt it was somebody very close to her, but they didn't know who. So then the next step for the police is that they wanted to run DNA through CODIS on the white earbud that was found in the hallway. Obviously it was the perpetrator's earbud, the person had dropped it, but when they ran it through CODIS, it came back with no matches. So it was another dead end, unfortunately, for the detectives. The police were so desperate to solve this case that they also went to the prison to visit Yolanda's baby daddy, Jeffrey Wilson. And they talked to him and they asked him, you know, do you think this is retaliation for what you did, you know what I'm saying, to somebody in those apartments over 20 years ago? Do you think somebody, you know, put a hit on Yolanda because of, you know, the two people that you killed? And at that point, Jeffrey just refused to talk to the police. He's like, you know what? I've been in prison for the past 20 years. I have nothing to do with this. Leave me alone. Get out of here. Even though they went down there to talk to Jeffrey, unfortunately for the police, they were no closer to solving Yolanda's death. Now, Sergeant Woods also believed that another man might be a suspect, which was one of the building supervisors. His name was Mr. Darnell, and he was the building superintendent. A lot of people in the building got weird vibes from Mr. Darnell. He was kind of weird. He would kind of stare at the residents. You know, them creepy type, you know, every apartment got a creepy, you know, superintendent, honey. He's supposed to be sweeping the hallways, making sure everything is up to par. But, you know, he just kind of, you know, stares at people. He has really weird conversation. So there were whispers that maybe Mr. Darnell had something to do with it because again he's the building superintendent and he has every key in that building could he have made a key and broke into yolanda's apartment to rob and kill her who knows now when they look further into mr darnell they realize that mr darnell was not there the day of that murder he was actually off that day so once they realize that they stop looking at him as a suspect in the case so in the meantime weeks are going by months are going by the seasons are changing and a lot of people are starting to gossip a lot of the family members of yolanda are getting weird vibes from kwame He's not acting like the grieving son, like he should be acting. Yolanda's birthday came and went and Kwame didn't say anything on Facebook. He didn't wish his mother a happy birthday. He didn't send her any type of remembrance. And a lot of people thought that that was really weird because again, there should be a close mother and son bond. And he was just acting like it was just business as normal. And this wasn't sitting well with a lot of people, especially Yolanda's brother. In the meantime, the former suspect, Mr. Darnell, was working with the police and they were combing through hours and hours of surveillance video. And then soon they hit on something. Around 4.30 in the morning on September 2nd, 2012, they spotted a strange man coming into the building and he was wearing a bunch of layers of clothing. He also had a duffel bag and he was also holding a bottle of detergent. And it was very weird to see this person coming into the building at 4.30 a.m. looking like this. So that stood out to detectives. Now, initially, the police thought, well, maybe it's somebody coming in from a long day of work. Maybe they're really tired. They got to do laundry. But then the more they thought about it, it didn't make sense because this was early September meaning that it was still warm outside and it was too warm to be wearing so many layers of clothing. So obvious this person who's wearing all these layers of clothing planned on changing their clothes to fool the camera. Another thing that they noticed is that the strange man was trying hard to hide from the cameras. He had a hoodie on and he had it tied really tight where you could barely see his face. And as he's walking, he's walking with his head down. So that looked really, really suspicious that he's doing all this at 4.30 in the morning. Normally, if you're coming in at 4.30 in the morning, you're tired, you're not trying to hide from cameras, you just wanna get into your apartment, 
crawl into bed, and go to sleep. About five minutes later, around 4.35, an unidentified man is seen opening the door for another unidentified man who's preparing to leave the building. Now, the person who's seen leaving the building has a similar height, stature, and weight as the person they saw five minutes earlier entering the building. Now, all of this weird activity between these two men took place 10 minutes before a 911 call was made. Now, what was so strange is as they're watching this video with Mr. Darnell, it seems like he's trying to protect this person somewhat. He seems kind of shocked and he's saying, no, no, it couldn't be. And the police are like, well, who is that? And he's like scared to tell the police at this point. So now they're just like, what is going on? Who is this guy? We need more information. So now they start talking to Mr. Darnell and saying, you need to tell us who this person is. Now, Mr. Darnell admits that he knows the person who's walking in at 4.35 in the morning. He says that the man walking in is a man named Michael and that he lives on the same floor as Yolanda Holmes. So a few days after this revelation came out, Mr. Darnell agreed with the police to set up a meeting with this man named Michael and the police were gonna be surveilling everything. So after Mr. Darnell met with Michael and they talked to him, the police also had a conversation with him. And unfortunately, Michael was innocent. He was just happening to come in because his grandmother lived on that floor. It's his grandmother's apartment. He had been working the late shift and as the alleged killer was going out, Michael was honestly going into the apartment to get some sleep. It just happened to be a coincidence that he was going in at the same time that the killer was leaving out. So at this point, they asked Michael, well, who was the guy that you held the door for as he was leaving the building? And Michael was like, well, I don't know. You know, it's 4.35 in the morning. I'm tired. I'm, you know, going upstairs to go to sleep. You know, somebody was coming out. I held the door open as they were coming out and I went in. So Michael sadly was no help in describing or giving a description of the potential killer. Now, one thing that the surveillance video did capture is that the strange man with all the clothing on, when he went into the building, he had the earbuds. You could see it on the surveillance footage. But when he came out a short while later, the earbuds were gone. So detectives put two and two together and realized those were the earbuds that were found at the crime scene. Another identifying feature is that the man who walked into the building was wearing an Adidas sweat jacket, but then when he walked out of the building, he had taken the jacket off and he had switched into something else. Another thing they noticed on the surveillance cameras when he walked in, he had a pair of white shoes on, but when he walked out, he had a pair of black shoes on. So this man was trying his hardest to fool the camera. He wanted to walk in looking one way and then walk out looking another way. So that way it looked like two different people were in and out of the building at the same time. Now, one of the things that stood out the most to detectives is that the man used the building's intercom to get into the building, meaning that he had to been buzzed in by somebody. Was it Yolanda who buzzed in the murderer? Or did he just hit a random apartment number and somebody just buzzed him in? Because sometimes you'll get people who will buzz your apartment. They're not necessarily coming to visit you. They just need access in the building for something. And sometimes people will let folks in. So was that the situation? Or did this person know Yolanda personally and Yolanda was waiting for them to come up? Now, Yolanda's funeral and homegoing service was beautiful. A lot of people in the community turned out to her funeral and they had just some of the most wonderful things to say about her. But one person who was notably absent from the funeral was Curtis, her boyfriend. Now there was a woman named Julie Teal who was at the funeral and she recalled not seeing Curtis and finding that very strange that he didn't show up. She also went to talk to Kwame and she basically told Kwame the following. She told Kwame that she truly loved Yolanda and Yolanda was one of those special people that everybody could count on to be there for them and that she was just a beautiful spirit and she was just so sorry and very apologetic that he lost his mother. She said that when she said this to Kwame, he really didn't react and she kind of dismissed it as maybe he's just numb. This is his mother. He's the only child. You know, his father's in prison, so now it's just him by himself in the world. On the one-year anniversary of Yolanda's murder, the community was once again growing very restless, and they were putting a lot of pressure on the police to find out 
who murdered a member and a pillar of their community. They were not going to allow another black woman to be murdered without getting some type of justice. But they would soon be shocked to find out who is behind this murder. So one of the things that helped break this case is that after a year, the police were able to subpoena and get her phone records. Yolanda had three separate phone lines. And so the police had to painstakingly comb through each phone line to try and find some type of connection and to try and figure out what led to this woman's murder. Now, one of her phone lines was a landline and that was used in case of emergencies and it was also used to buzz people in to her apartment. Now, even though Curtis was still seen as a suspect in many people's eyes, once they ran his phone records as well, it showed that he couldn't have been the one who called downstairs to get buzzed in. So at that point, Curtis was no longer being seen as a suspect. Now, phone records do show that at 4.30 in the morning, Yolanda's landline was buzzed by somebody downstairs, but it's hard to tell if she buzzed them in or not. There's no way to prove that part of it. It just shows that a call came through. So after that, the police went through her phone records one more time, and they ended up finding a really strange number. This phone number had only called Yolanda one time. That was before her death. And then this random phone number never contacted Yolanda again. It's as if this person knew that Yolanda was dead, so why call her? So at that point, the police decided to skip trace the number, and the number hit on a man named Eugene Spencer. Now, when they ran Eugene Spencer's background, they found out that he had a criminal background and that he was arrested back in 2013 for robbery. So in December of 2013, they brought Eugene Spencer down to the precinct to question him about why his phone number was in Yolanda's phone and he never called her again after that. Meanwhile, the police ran a DNA test on Eugene Spencer and those earbuds that were found at the scene of the crime. And lo and behold, everything came back a match. This is what the police were looking for. This is what Yolanda's family was looking for. This is what the community was looking for. Finally, the police had irrefutable evidence that this man, Eugene Spencer, was there at the time that Yolanda was murdered in her home in cold blood. Now, initially, Eugene Spencer denied everything. He said he wasn't there. He had nothing to do with it. Once they brought out the earbuds, showing that this was a match and letting him know that, yeah, we match your DNA to the earbud that was found in Yolanda's apartment, you might wanna go ahead and tell us what really happened. So at that point, Eugene changes his whole story. He then says he went there just to rob her and take some money, but that's it. He had nothing to do with the killing. So they kept pressing him again, and then finally he just broke down and told everything that happened. So at this point, Eugene is confessing and admitting to killing Yolanda and stabbing Curtis. But the next bombshell that he got ready to drop it sent chills up the detective's spine. So Eugene says that the reason why he killed Yolanda is because her own son put him up to it. Eugene told Detective Krolis and Sergeant Woods that Yolanda's own son, Kwame Wilson, ordered the hit on his own mother. Eugene says that Kwame had offered him $7,000 because he knew that he was gonna be the sole beneficiary of Yolanda's life insurance policy. He was the only child. And he knew that she had a $90,000 life insurance policy. All he had to do was give him $7,000 and you know, Eugene was willing to kill Yolanda for this. Well, come to find out, Kwame was not a man of his word. He gave that man $70, yes, for killing his mother. $70 out of $90,000 for killing his mom. So because Kwame decided to cheat Eugene, Eugene basically took Kwame down with him. He said, if I'm going down for his mother's murder, he's going down as well for cheating me out of what was rightfully mine. So he told it all. He sang like a straight canary in the damn investigation room. So Eugene Spencer tells the police that basically Kwame was the one who gave him the revolver that was used to kill his mother. On top of that, he said Kwame also gave him the change of clothing, the bag, the detergent, and everything else that he needed to complete the job. Now, if that wasn't sick enough, Kwame decided to stay on the phone with Spencer to make sure that Spencer got the job done. 
So he was talking to Spencer and hyping him up the whole time before. Once Spencer got into the building, Kwame was the person on the phone. That is why Spencer had the earbuds in his ear so that way he could speak to Kwame. So Kwame told Eugene, just walk up to the building like you live there and then my mom will buzz you in. Police later on found out that strange number that showed up in Yolanda's phone was actually Kwame's burner phone that he was using to contact his mom. So what happened is that earlier that night, Kwame had called Yolanda and told Yolanda that he was gonna be coming home late and that, you know, he would just buzz when he gets outside and, you know, to buzz him in. Kwame told Eugene, when you buzz my mom and you call her phone, don't say anything because she's not gonna recognize your voice. Just cough and she'll know that it's me and she'll let you in. So once Yolanda hears the buzz from the intercom, she gets up to listen and she hears a cough and she just assumes it's her son. You know, it's late at night. He might not be feeling good. Let me go ahead and buzz him in. And Yolanda buzzes him in and gets back in the bed with Curtis to get some sleep for the next day because she had to be at work. So now Eugene makes it into the home and he's able to walk directly to Yolanda's bedroom because Kwame gave him a map of what the apartment looked like. So he knew exactly which bedroom to walk into. And as soon as he walks into the bedroom, he shoots Yolanda in the head. Kwame is literally listening to this man walking into his mother's bedroom. He's listening to this man cock the gun back. He then tells Eugene, make sure that bitch is dead. So after Kwame tells him that, Eugene then makes his way to the kitchen to go grab a knife to stab her to make sure that she's dead like Kwame told him. And as he's making his way back to Yolanda's bedroom is when Curtis sees him. So at this point, Curtis is confused. He heard a gunshot. There's a strange guy in the apartment. So that is when him and Eugene start fighting. And Eugene ends up stabbing Curtis and also knocking him out with the butt of the gun. So now at this point, Eugene is pissed. He's livid. He's thinking it was a setup by Kwame and that maybe Kwame was setting him up to get killed by Curtis. Once he's done Kwame's dirty work by killing his mother, then Curtis was going to come and kill him and then Kwame would get all the money. So at this point, Eugene is livid. He's pissed. So after he knocks out Curtis, he then goes back into Yolanda's bedroom and he stabs her over and over and over again. The overkill that the police saw was Eugene pissed off because he had assumed that Kwame set him up. So now that the truth is coming out, the police are seeing that Curtis's story is matching everything he said over a year ago. It's now matched with everything that Eugene Spencer is also telling the police. He thought that Curtis was going to kill him. Curtis didn't know what was going on. And the whole time Kwame is downstairs enjoying his handiwork. So now it made sense as to why Curtis had memory lapse and why he seemed very distant and just kind of odd. He was going through his own form of PTSD. Imagine waking up and your girlfriend has been shot in the head next to you while you guys were laying there sleeping in bed. And then you go to try and find out what's going on only to be assaulted by the assailant in the kitchen. So he was going through a lot, hence why he responded in the manner in which he responded. So one of the questions that people ask all the time is, what caused Kwame to you know, commit matricide? Why would he do this to his own mother? Now, what they're saying is that basically Kwame had lost his job. Yolanda had helped Kwame get several jobs over the years. At this point, Kwame is the big age of 23, and he's not taking anything serious, and Yolanda is tired of it. So once he gets fired from this job, he has no income coming in, and Yolanda at this point has put her foot down, and she's saying, I'm not helping you anymore. You're spoiled. You don't want to work. You just want to come and go as you please. This acting that you're doing on YouTube is not paying off because he wasn't monetized. His rap career was trash because he couldn't really rap. So at this point, Yolanda was frustrated with him as a mother because she's a hustler. She's grinding. She's running her own shop. Meanwhile, her son is just doing whatever he wants to do. So at that point, the evil greed monster 
crept into his psyche. Once Yolanda cut him off financially, he was pissed. This was a young man who had been spoiled from the time he was a child. He had the latest clothing, latest shoes, freshest hairstyles, and because he wasn't able to maintain appearances for the girls and for his homeboys, it really pissed him off that his mother would tell him no, that his mother would stop funding his lifestyle while he was in between jobs. He was that upset that he decided to put together a plan to not only make him get rich fast, but to also execute his own mother. He knew that once she was out of the way, he would have access to her $90,000 life insurance policy on top of her cars. He would also end up owning her salon. So he would also be making money off of that. So for Kwame, Maine, his mother was just a stumbling block. She was just an obstacle in the way of his greed. Now, the sad thing about this is that I believe that Kwame Maine wasn't really able to enjoy that money. Because this is how he started going viral. I'm gonna take out twenty thousand, man, just to show people. You feel me? I'm I'm on a whole different level with this, man. I ain't, you know, I take this serious, man. So you can't put me in the same category as the other. I remember a lot of fans emailing me back then when all this was going down that something wasn't right with Kwame. They were saying, you know, the guy from Nick's stories, he's out here in Chicago, he's throwing out money, he's flossing, like something doesn't seem right. Why is he squandering his mother's life insurance policy money like this? It didn't make any sense. He was literally going to ATMs, pulling money out of the ATMs, going into banks, and then just throwing money in the air, money that he killed his own mother for. He just treated it like it didn't have any value to him. Kwame not only stunted his newfound fame on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, he also bought $1,500 puppies. He bought cars. He put Lamborghini doors on them. He also made sure his click was laced up. I mean, he did a lot with this money. Meanwhile, Yolanda's family, especially her brother, was just looking at this like, what the hell is going on with this kid? Something is not right with all of this. But in the meantime, nobody's realizing that the police are investigating and homing in on Kwame. They're just trying to gather evidence. So everything that he was doing on social media, all the showboating, the bragging he was doing was going to be his downfall sooner or later. Kwame Wilson, Eugene Spencer, and Lorena Johnson, who was the getaway driver for Eugene, she ended up getting charged as well. Eugene Spencer was charged with robbery, home invasion, and first degree murder. Kwame was charged with first degree murder. And Lorena Johnson was charged as the driver in this murder case. She ended up receiving seven years and she has since been paroled. She is now a free woman. Eugene Spencer got 100 years in prison. And Kwame Wilson, the mastermind behind all of this, just evilness towards his mother, received 99 years in prison. During the trial, which took place in 2019, Curtis verified that Eugene Spencer was the man in the kitchen who tried to kill him. On top of that, they were able to find video from other buildings showing Lorena Johnson as the getaway driver. And most of all, prosecutors were able to use all of the footage that Kwame uploaded onto the internet of himself flashing jewelry and money and doing all types of extravagant things. They were able to prove that Kwame did this for nothing more than greed. During sentencing, Cook County Judge Stanley Sachs looked dead into Kwame's dead ass eyes and told him, matricide is the murder of one's own mother. His mother spoiled him, gave him anything he wanted. She gave Kwame a car, helped him get jobs. Many could say that Kwame is spoiled because Yolanda gave him life only for her son to take her life. Now, what's crazy about this situation is that Kwame wanted to say some final words before the sentencing. And this is what he told the jury. He said, I just wanna say, nobody loved my mother more than me. She's all I had. Well, Kwame, if you really loved your mother and she was all you had, you wouldn't have plotted to kill her. If that's what you consider love, then who needs enemies? Yolanda's friends, Eric and Julia Teal, were just shocked. They were there every day of the trial and they just didn't understand how a child that they watched grow up in this shock for over 16 years could do what Kwame did, especially being that Yolanda gave so selflessly 
of herself to her son. The sad thing is that every now and then I visit Yolanda's Facebook page. I remember visiting it for the first time eight years ago. And there was some warnings that Yolanda, it seemed like she was kind of crying out for help. On her Facebook page back in July of 2011, she wrote the following. It's been a while and most of you know my phone was stolen. I don't have any numbers. Please text me your number. And I would like to thank my sister Yvonne for the love and prayers and big ups to my offspring. He landed a job with Red Bull. I saw your poster on Michigan Avenue. Keep up the good work, son. No matter what, Yolanda was so proud of this young man. There were so many pictures on her Facebook page of Kwame, Kwame's tattoos, her and Kwame. There's even pictures of both of the killers. Yolanda knew both of these people. She knew Eugene, she knew Lorena. It's very, very disturbing that those closest to her, those that she would have given a shirt off of her back, ended up taking her life. Now, what's even more disturbing is that a year before her murder, she wrote this on Facebook. She stated on October 9th, 2011, my offspring is out of control. Please pray for me. That message haunts me to this day because that sounded like a mother who was at her wit's end, who's looking for prayer and who just wants her son to do the right thing. And the fact that he was just so out of control and disrespecting her is just really sad, especially being that she went out of her way to take care of Kwame and to instill values in him of hard work and running your own business. And Kwame just wanted to do what Kwame wanted to do. He's a typical narcissist. So in closing, a lot of people say that blood is thicker than water, but that's not always the case because in the case of Kwame Wilson and Yolanda Holmes, it proved that blood was no thicker than water. Betraying the person that brought you into this world is the ultimate sin. Yolanda gave Kwame life and Kwame foolishly repaid her by taking her life. But the good thing with all of this, the ray of sunshine in this, is that Yolanda's legacy will forever live on. To this day, people still comment on her Facebook page. Friends and family still wish her happy birthday. She's definitely missed and she was definitely a pillar of her community. So rest in peace, Yolanda. I'm very sorry that your own child that you gave birth to betrayed you in such a manner, but just know that your legacy will not die in vain. As far as Kwame, good riddance and enjoy your 99 years in prison. Once again, thank you guys so much for tuning in to True Crime Tea Time. Make sure you guys leave a comment down below and let me know what you guys think of this story. Have a good day and be blessed. Bye. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. You wanted to come to me. Discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time. Dark history, it's true crime season.